This is Tom Fox. I think everyone knows of my love for classic monster movies. I have blogged about them, I have podcasted about them, I have talked about them, and I've decided for the month of October, I'm going to mine great monsters, great mad scientists, and some of these creations for leadership lessons for compliance practitioners. So over the month of October on Popcorn and Compliance, I'm going to feature Frankenstein, the Wolfman, the Mummy, Count Dracula, perhaps the Invisible Man, perhaps some mad scientists. It's going to be a fun exploration of a topic that I thoroughly enjoy and is certainly near and dear to my heart. For our final offering this month on Popcorn and Compliance, we take up the 1931 film version of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Once again, it was a pre-code horror film starring Frederick March, who plays the possessed Dr. Hyde, excuse me, Dr. Jekyll, who tests his new formula that kind of unleash people's inner demons. The film is an adaption of the book, A Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And it makes a pretty big change from the book because in the book, Dr. Jekyll takes the formula to keep from turning into Mr. Hyde or having Mr. Hyde take him over. But in the movie, Dr. Jekyll, a kind doctor in Victorian London, is certain that within each man lurks the impulses for both good and evil. He's desperately in love with his fiance and wants to marry her immediately, but his father orders them, her father orders them to wait. One night, when walking home with a colleague, Jekyll spots a bar singer being attacked by a man outside a boarding house. Jekyll drives the man away and carries the bar singer up to her room. She tries to seduce Jekyll, and though he is tempted, he does not accept her entrees. Jekyll begins to experiment with drugs that he believes will unleash his evil side, however. After imbibing in a concoction of these, he transforms into Edward Hyde, an impulsive, sadistic, violent, and amoral man who indulges in his every desire. He Hyde finds the music hall singer, and he offers to support her financially in return for her company. They stay at her boarding house where Hyde rapes and psychologically manipulates her. When Hyde reads in the paper that his fiancée is returning to London, he leaves Ivy, the singer, but threatens that he'll return when she least expects it. Overcome with guilt, Jekyll sends money to her on the advice of her landlady. She goes to see Dr. Jekyll and recognizes him as the man who saved her from abuse that night. She tearfully tells him about her situation with Hyde, and Jekyll reassures her that she will never see Hyde again. But the next night, when walking to a party at Muriel's where the wedding date is to be announced, Jekyll spontaneously changes into Hyde, and rather to attend, rather attending the party, he goes to Ivy's room and murders her. Hyde returns to Jekyll's house, but is refused admission by the butler. Desperate Hyde writes a letter to his friend Layton, instructing him to take certain chemicals to Jekyll's lab from Jekyll's laboratory and take them home. When Hyde arrives, Layton pulls a gun and demands that Hyde take him to Jekyll with no other choice. Hyde drinks the formula and changes back into Jekyll before a shock. Aware that he cannot control his transformations, Jekyll goes to his fiancée's home to break off the engagement. After he leaves, he stands on the terrace and watches his now ex-fiancée cry. This triggers another transformation as Hyde, he enters the house and assaults her. Her father tries to drive him away, but Hyde beats him to death with Jekyll's walking stick and flees back to Jekyll's laboratory, where he takes his formula again and reverts to Jekyll. Lennon recognizes the broken cane at the crime scene and takes the police to Jekyll's home, but Jekyll tells them that Hyde has already left. Lennon insists that Jekyll and Hyde are one and the same. The stress causes another transformation from Jekyll into Hyde, and after a fierce struggle, Hyde is shot by the police, and dying, he transforms back into Jekyll. As I mentioned in the book, it's quite a bit different because Jekyll is trying to keep himself from transforming 
and to hide, and he does so with increasing frequency. So what does all of this mean for a compliance professional? I'm going to base the next series of comments on an article in Psychological Today by Joel Brockner, and it's entitled, When Bosses Can Be Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So it's certainly unnerving when people in authority have inconsistent personalities. And if you've ever been an employee, that's one of the things that you've probably noticed in your bosses. But it can be particularly destructive in the workplace. And indeed, Brockner believes that Jekyll and Hyde may not be so unusual in the workplace. Behaving morally like Jekyll may cause bosses to frequently become immoral like Hyde. In one study, employees were asked to describe the behavior of their bosses from one day to next. Bosses who behaved more ethically on the first day were more likely to behave abusively towards their subordinates on the next day. That's an interesting finding. The more that bosses on the first day did things like define success, not by results, but by process, set an example, are how they might change. The reasons include simply bad breaks, and that's defined as moral licensing, in which the idea that people want to think of themselves and that their behavior as moral or ethical. And having behaved ethically, people are somewhat paradoxically free to behave less ethically, either because their prior behavior gave them moral credits in their psychological ledger, or it proved to be them to be fine, upstanding citizens. Another explanation was noted as called ego depletion, which assumes that people have a limited amount of self-control resources. Ego depletion refers to how people exerting self-control in one situation are less able to do so in a subsequent situation. Ego depletion helps to explain, for instance, why employees tend to make more ethical decisions earlier in the day than later in the day. Throughout the day, we are called upon to behave in certain ways that require self-control, which are not yelling at the driver who may cut us off at the, on our commute to work when we used to have to commute to work, not having a second helping of a delicious dessert, or not expressing negative emotions about people at work. Because we have fewer self-control resources later in the day, we are more susceptible to succumbing to the temptation to behave unethically. This last point I thought was really interesting because one of the interesting things about risk and risk management is on Thursday and Friday, fraud risk can go up. Why is that? People are less focused and they're thinking about the weekend. Now, many companies are seeing some people returning to work on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, <coughs> working from home on Monday and Friday. What does that dichotomy of split mean for your risk management, your cybersecurity, the ethical behavior of your organization? We rarely think of time as a risk, but these two concepts, I think, really put that at the fore. The theft from North Korea from the Bangladeshi Central Bank through New York a few years ago, the cyber attack was late on a Friday in the United States, and it was late on the last day before the weekend in Bangladesh. And this allowed the fraudsters a couple of days to get ahead with their theft before anyone realized what had gone wrong. We rarely think about those sorts of issues, but now as we move to a more hybrid working environment, you may want to consider what's the impact of working Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? What's the impact of working Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Uh, What happens, used to happen on Friday afternoon, is it now happening in London? I was interested to find out that the bar scene in London now heaves on Thursday because almost no one goes into work on Friday. If you think about five years ago, the bar scene tended to heave on Friday, which was the last day most people had for their traditional work week. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde bring us lots to think about from the compliance perspective. The Frederick March movie won an Academy Award. Some 10 years later, Spencer Tracy also played the title role, and that's an interesting 
performance by Tracy, one of America's greatest actors. Check out Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The book is also an interesting read. It's a short story or slash novella by Robert Louis Stevenson. I hope you've enjoyed this October's Monster Movie Fest. As anyone who's listened to my podcast knows, I'm a huge classic monster movie fan. And some of these are really, really worth a look, whether it's the poignancy and the pathos of Frankenstein's monster played by Boris Karloff, whether it's Charles Lofton performance in the Island of Lost Souls as Dr. Moreau as a truly mad scientist, or whether it's the dichotomy we see by Frederick March in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Some great old movies, some fun ways to think about compliance. Next, uh, Our next episode, we're going to go back to Richard Lummis and I looking at some Oscar-winning best pictures. So I hope you will continue to enjoy Popcorn and Compliance. I'd also like to tell you about a great new podcast series, which has premiered on the Compliance Podcast Network. That's The Corruption Files, where with Hughes Hubbard partner Mike D. Bernardis, we take a look at some of the top anti-corruption compliance enforcement actions across the globe. It's a great review of enforcement actions, literally 15 years old and coming forward, what they meant then and what they continue to mean now, all on the Compliance Podcast Network. <laughs>